Right now, over 17 million people are living in a place that, by all logic, shouldn't exist. When you look at a map of the Netherlands, you might not notice anything unusual. But if you could peel back the layers, you'd see the problem. Roughly one quarter of the country sits below sea level. Another 30% is barely above it. That means nearly two-thirds of the country is constantly at risk of being swallowed by the sea, flooded by rivers, or soaked by heavy rains. Yet the Netherlands is not underwater. It's one of the most densely populated, highly developed countries on Earth. Its cities, airports, farmland, and neighborhoods exist in places where, by all logic, they shouldn't. So how does this country hold back the water? How do entire cities function where entire seas used to be? And can this system survive the rising seas of the 21st century? The Netherlands literally means lowlands, and it lives up to the name. This small country in Western Europe is one of the lowest lying places on Earth. While most countries build their cities on high ground, much of the Netherlands was built by taking land back from the water. To understand why the Dutch have spent centuries fighting water, you first need to see just how risky their geography is. The Netherlands sits at the end of one of Europe's largest river systems. The Rhine, the Meuse, and the Scheldt all flow through multiple countries before they finally reach the North Sea. And they all meet here, at the Dutch coast. These rivers carry enormous volumes of water, especially during spring thaws or heavy rainfall further upstream. At the same time, the North Sea itself is far from calm. This shallow, storm-prone sea pushes waves and storm surges directly against the Dutch coastline. High winds and low atmospheric pressure can drive water levels up several meters in a matter of hours. But it doesn't stop there. Roughly 26% of the Netherlands is below sea level. Some of its most important infrastructure sits directly in these low zones. Schiphol Airport, one of Europe's busiest, sits about 4 meters below sea level. Rotterdam, one of the world's largest ports, lies just barely above sea level. Massive areas of farmland, industry, and residential neighborhoods sit in land that would be underwater without constant human intervention. On top of this, groundwater and heavy rains create constant pressure from below and above. Even without the rivers and the sea, much of the land would turn back into marsh if left alone. And now, climate change is making the situation worse. Sea levels are rising, rainstorms are becoming more intense, and the rivers fed by melting glaciers and heavier rainfall further inland are sending even more water toward the Dutch coast. The basic problem is simple. There's too much water and not enough elevation to keep it out. Without active management, large parts of the Netherlands would return to what they once were, lakes, swamps, and open sea. The Dutch battle with water is not just about geography. It's a story written by disaster after disaster. Over centuries, catastrophic floods forced the Netherlands to build better, stronger, and smarter defenses, or lose everything. One of the earliest and most devastating was the St. Elizabeth's Flood in 1421. After days of heavy rain and powerful storm surges, rivers broke through poorly maintained dikes. Entire villages disappeared under the water. Some areas, like the Biesbosch, were permanently lost to the flood, turning farmland into wetlands that still exist today. Historical estimates suggest that thousands of people died, though exact numbers remain uncertain. Another brutal flood came in 1717, the Christmas Flood. A massive storm surge struck the northern provinces of the Netherlands as well as parts of Germany and Denmark. In the Netherlands alone, over 2,000 people were killed, along with tens of thousands of livestock. Entire communities were swept away during a single night of chaos. But the flood that truly transformed Dutch water management came much later, in 1953. On the night of January 31, 1953, a severe windstorm in the North Sea combined with a high spring tide. The result was a perfect storm that overwhelmed dikes across the southwestern provinces. The sea surged over defenses that were never designed to handle such force. More than 1,800 people died. Over 47,000 buildings were damaged or destroyed. Hundreds of thousands of acres of farmland were flooded with salt water, ruining crops and soil for years. Families lost everything overnight. This disaster was not just a tragedy, it was a turning point. The government realized that traditional dikes alone were not enough. The existing system, much of it centuries old, 
simply couldn't keep up with stronger storms and higher seas. The 1953 flood pushed the Netherlands into a completely new era of water management, one that would lead to some of the largest and most sophisticated flood defense projects the world has ever seen. When you hear that the Dutch reclaimed land from the sea, it is not just a figure of speech. They physically drained areas that were once underwater and turned them into dry, usable land. This system is called poldering, and it's one of the most distinctive features of Dutch water management. A polder is a low-lying tract of land that has been enclosed by dikes. Once the dikes are built to keep outside water out, the remaining water inside is pumped away, leaving dry ground behind. But that dry ground doesn't stay dry by itself. Water constantly seeps in from rainfall, rivers, and groundwater. Without continuous pumping, many polders would quickly turn back into lakes. Historically, the Dutch used windmills to handle this constant drainage. These iconic structures were highly functional, pumping water from low fields into higher canals where it could be safely drained away. As technology advanced, windmills were replaced by modern pumping stations. Today, massive electric and diesel-powered pumps run 24-7 to keep polders dry. Some of these stations are capable of moving thousands of liters of water per second. One of the most famous examples of polder engineering is Flevoland, the newest province of the Netherlands established in 1986. It didn't exist a century ago. After years of planning and construction, engineers drained huge portions of the Azelmeer, a former inland sea, creating over 1,400 square kilometers of new land. Today, Flevoland is home to cities, farms, and forests, all sitting on land that was once underwater. Polders are not only about expanding territory, they also allow for better control over river floods, help regulate groundwater levels, and provide space for agriculture in a country where land is extremely valuable. But creating polders comes with risks. Because the land inside the dikes is lower than the water outside, any breach can lead to rapid and catastrophic flooding. That's why the Dutch don't just rely on polders alone. They back them up with a far more extensive system of dikes and barriers. If polders are the heart of Dutch land reclamation, dikes are its armor. Without them, none of this would exist. The Netherlands has built one of the most extensive and sophisticated dike networks on Earth, protecting both reclaimed and naturally low-lying land from the constant threat of flooding. Modern Dutch dikes are carefully engineered structures made of layers of clay, sand, and stone. They're designed to resist not just water pressure, but waves, erosion, and even earthquakes. Throughout the country, there are over 17,000 kilometers of primary and secondary dikes, enough to stretch nearly halfway around the planet. These defenses stand between the North Sea, rivers, lakes, and millions of people living below water level. One of the most famous of these is the Afsluit Dike, or Closure Dike. Completed in 1932, it's a 32-kilometer-long dam that closed off the Zuider Zee, a large inland bay that had been a constant source of flooding for centuries. By sealing it off, the Dutch transformed the dangerous bay into a freshwater lake, now called the Asselmeer, which allowed for the creation of new polders like Flevoland. The Afsluitdijk is not just a barrier, it's also a highway, a bike path, and a symbol of Dutch engineering. In recent years, it's been undergoing major upgrades to prepare for higher sea levels and stronger storms, including the addition of storm surge gates, new pumping stations, and reinforcement of its core structure. But the Afslutik is only one part of a much larger system. Across the country, dikes are continuously inspected, maintained, and upgraded. Sensors monitor their stability. Emergency plans exist for quick reinforcement if cracks or weaknesses are detected. The Dutch approach is clear. Prevention is always cheaper than recovery. However, even these massive dikes are not enough to protect the entire country, especially when dealing with the most extreme storms. That's where the Netherlands takes things to another level, with some of the largest movable flood barriers in the world. After the devastating North Sea flood of 1953, it became clear that traditional dikes weren't enough. The government launched one of the most ambitious flood defense programs ever attempted, the Delta Works. The Delta Works is not a single structure. It's a system of dams, sluices, locks, storm surge barriers, and levees designed to protect the southwestern part of the Netherlands, an area where multiple rivers meet the sea and where much of the land lies below sea level. Construction of the Delta Works began in 1954. It took decades to complete, 
with different sections coming online as technology advanced and priorities shifted. One of the most famous components is the Oosterscheldekring, or Eastern Scheldt Storm Surge Barrier. This massive structure stretches over 9 kilometers and features 62 huge sliding gates. Under normal conditions, the gates remain open to allow tidal flow, preserving the estuary's delicate ecosystem. But when a major storm threatens, the gates close, blocking the sea from flooding the lowlands behind it. The decision to make the Oosterscheldekering partially open was a compromise. Early plans called for sealing off the entire estuary, but environmental concerns led to a design that balances flood protection with marine life preservation. This flexibility has allowed the region's fishing industry and wildlife to continue thriving while still providing protection against extreme storms. Another key piece of the Delta Works is the Mace Lankering, which protects the city of Rotterdam, home to Europe's largest port. The Maislant barrier consists of two massive floating gates, each as long as the Eiffel Tower is tall. When closed, they form a watertight seal across the new waterway, preventing storm surges from entering Rotterdam's harbor and city center. Unlike fixed barriers, the Maislantkering operates automatically. Sophisticated computer models constantly monitor sea levels, wind speeds, and tides. When a storm surge is predicted to reach 3 meters above normal sea level, the barrier swings shut. Once the danger passes, it opens again to allow normal shipping traffic. The scale of these projects is hard to overstate. Combined, the Delta Works has reduced the length of coastline that needs protection from over 700 kilometers to just 80 kilometers, a far more manageable task. But none of this comes cheap. The Delta Works cost billions of dollars to build, and requires constant maintenance. Teams of engineers, technicians, and inspectors work year-round to keep the entire system operational. Yet, most Dutch citizens see this as a necessary investment. After all, the alternative is unthinkable. While many countries build flood defenses as emergency responses, the Dutch approach is long-term, calculated, and constantly evolving. But even the Delta Works is not the final word in Dutch water management. In recent years, the country has taken a new approach that might sound surprising. Sometimes the best way to fight water is to give it space. For centuries, the Dutch tried to block out the water completely, but in recent decades they've shifted toward a different strategy, learning to live with the water rather than constantly fighting against it. One of the clearest examples is the Room for the River program. Launched in the early 2000s, this project focused on the country's major rivers like the Rhine, which have become increasingly dangerous due to heavier rainfall and upstream flooding. Instead of simply raising dikes higher, engineers created extra space where rivers can safely overflow during high water events. This meant relocating some homes and farms, lowering floodplains, digging side channels, and modifying urban areas to allow temporary flooding in controlled zones. In some cases, entire sections of land were turned back into wetlands or nature reserves that can absorb excess water when needed. The idea sounds simple. Give the water somewhere safe to go so it doesn't end up where people live. But executing it required years of planning, negotiations, and engineering. Beyond large-scale projects, the Dutch have also integrated water management into city planning and architecture. In neighborhoods prone to flooding, some houses are built on floating platforms or designed to rise with the water. Others are built on artificial mounds called terps, which have been used in the region since ancient times. Urban parks and public spaces often double as emergency reservoirs. During heavy rainfall, these areas can temporarily hold water, preventing it from overwhelming drainage systems. Even governance is uniquely adapted to the water challenge. The Netherlands has a system of water boards. Regional organizations responsible for managing water levels, maintaining dikes, and ensuring drainage. These water boards are some of the oldest democratic institutions in the world, with some tracing their roots back to the 13th century. The Dutch approach is highly decentralized and hyper-local. People who live within each water district directly elect representatives to their water boards. This ensures that decisions about flood protection and water management are made by people who live with the consequences. The Dutch have built one of the most resilient water management systems on Earth. But even this system faces new and growing threats. They have spent centuries building defenses that work. 
but the future may bring challenges unlike anything the country has faced before. Sea levels are rising and the pace is accelerating. According to the Royal Netherlands Meteorological Institute, sea levels along the Dutch coast have been rising by roughly 2 millimeters per year for much of the 20th century. In recent decades, that rate has increased and projections for the 21st century suggest far steeper rises depending on global emissions and ice sheet melting. A rise of even half a meter would put enormous strain on current defenses. At one meter, major upgrades would be unavoidable. At two meters, a scenario some scientists warn could happen by the year 2100. The entire system would need radical redesign or expansion. And it's not just the sea. Heavier rainfall and more intense storms increase river flood risks. Upstream in Germany and Switzerland, melting glaciers and extreme rain events are sending more water down the Rhine and Meuse rivers, pushing existing river defenses to their limits. The Dutch are fully aware of these risks. That's why they're not waiting for disaster to strike. One innovation already in place is the sand motor, an experimental project along the South Holland coast. Instead of building hard structures like seawalls, engineers pumped 21 million cubic meters of sand onto the shore in 2011. Natural ocean currents then gradually spread the sand along the coastline, reinforcing beaches and dunes while allowing nature to do much of the work. If successful long-term, this type of solution could be repeated elsewhere. Advanced forecasting and monitoring technology is also playing a bigger role. Real-time data from satellites, tide gauges, and weather models help water managers predict and respond to threats before they escalate into disasters. Internationally, the Dutch have become leading experts in flood defense, exporting their knowledge to places like New Orleans, Vietnam, and Bangladesh, where rising seas threaten millions of people. Personally, I think we're going to see a lot more countries borrowing Dutch ideas very soon. But I'd love to hear your take.